In local matters, voters in Virginia will head to the polls on Tuesday to choose the Democratic nominee for governor. There are five candidates fighting for the position, including the state's former leader who wants his old job back. And some say the outcome of this race could give hints as to what next year's midterms will look like. Aaron Navarro is a CBS News political associate producer. He's been covering this race, and he's here now to talk about it. Uh, good to see you. Um, so let's talk about former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, who seems to be the candidate to watch. You actually caught up with McAuliffe in the past few weeks. Let's play some of what he said to you. I'll try every day as governor to work with everybody if it will move our big, bold agenda forward. And there are some that just won't do it. Glenn Youngkin with Trump, part of this whole big lie conspiracy that somehow the election was stolen. I, I got to tell you, first of all, I find that so offensive. They're running down the democracy of America is how we're viewed around the globe. So, Aaron, what else did you get from that interview with Governor McAuliffe? So what I took away from that interview and, and just watching Terry on the trail is that he's running like he's already in the general election, that he already has the Democrat nomination. He brings up Republican nominee Glenn Youngkin and Trump a lot, and he doesn't really mention any of of the other Democratic uh, primary candidates. Uh, he also points to his past experience as governor, saying he's led the state out of a crisis before and can do it through this uh, pandemic recovery. It's a similar playbook, right, to Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential primaries. He frequently made the case that he has the experience. He's the candidate to beat the Republican in, in November. And McAuliffe is doing the same here. Part of that approach, though, is that McAuliffe has led by double digits in virtually every poll. He has a name recognition, not only from his time as governor, but in his involvement on the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton in 2016, um, Governor Northam's race in 2017, the House of Delegates races in 2019, and then stumping for Biden in 2020. So Terry McAuliffe has essentially been the face of the Virginia Democratic Party for most of the last decade. So people know who he is, they know how they feel about him, and there hasn't really been a coalescing around one of the other candidates to really get ahead of him. Two black women entered this race before McAuliffe did. Former state delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy and state senator Jennifer McClellan. Uh, obviously, if one of them wins uh, the primary and then the actual uh, gubernatorial race, and they would be the, the first black woman to be the governor of Virginia. Uh, you spoke to both Car uh, Carroll Foy and McClellan. I want to play some of that sound. Virginians just aren't excited right now to elect another you know, multi-millionaire, out-of-touch politician. Because the broken politics of the past and status quo um, has left so many Virginians behind. The racial wealth gap has exploded, child poverty has increased, and some of our schools are just as underfunded today as they were 20 years ago. I'm running for an office uh, that, ha there's no playbook. I mean, you know, there's no playbook for a black woman governor. And so I've had to create the playbook a little bit, and COVID was certainly a challenge. But uh, black women are used to doing things that people don't expect us to do. So then how has McAuliffe entering the race um, affected these candidates? So these candidates knew that McAuliffe jumping into the race was always a possibility. When he launched his campaign in December of 2020, Carol Foy already had a statement calling him out of touch. But what McAuliffe does is he has that name ID, he has a lot of money and support from most of the Black Caucus in Virginia's legislature. These are all things that if McAuliffe was not in the race, could have been split amongst Carol Foy, McClellan, or any of the other candidates. But the other thing McAuliffe's candidacy does is provide a known establishment of moderate uh, figure to voters that they have a better feeling can win in November. While Virginia Democrats have been winning in recent elections, one political scientist in the state told me um, that Democrats still hesitate to go for the more liberal alternative in fear that they could lose the general. Uh, the losses are readily accessible memories, they said. Uh, Clinton James, the founder of the Collective PAC, which supports black candidates, said older black voters follow this trend and tend to vote for the moderate candidate they think white voters will gravitate towards in November, such as McAuliffe. Now, the black voter base is not monolithic, and both McClellan and Carol Foy are looking to tap into the whole electorate. But this does cut into that base that could impact their chances. The 2020 race and even the Georgia Senate runoffs earlier this year saw a high voter turnout. I want to play a clip from an interview you did with Candy King, a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. 
I am worried about people not coming out to vote because we don't have, you know, we have a real president now, so we don't have the the person in the White House, you know, really energizing folks to come out and have their voices be heard. So turnout will be critical. So uh, what else are you hearing uh, from your sources on expected turnout Tuesday? The expected turnout is somewhere between 250 to 450,000. And a low turnout for the Democratic primaries in Virginia is, is part of the course. It's usually in the single digits for the primaries, but a much bigger showing in November. For example, in 2017, the last gubernatorial election, about 542,000 voters came out for that primary. That jumped to 2.6 million in November. Uh, what this primary turnout could tell us is how engaged Democrats are at this moment with Trump out of office and Biden in. And if there's still a bit of voter fatigue in statewide races, especially after a busy 2020 election, the Georgia Senate uh, runoffs, the insurrection, it's been a busy political time. And, and but what I'm looking for next in turnout is in November. Are Democrats still energized, even with Trump not on the ballot? Does President Biden motivate enough, Demo or, or, or motivate enough Republicans to turn out um, even with Trump not on the ballot. So that race in November will be a temperature check for both parties ahead of 2022. And the turnout there is what I'm looking for. So the five Democratic candidates had their final debate earlier this week. I, I read an interesting article that, that suggested that McAuliffe's big challenge is going to be answering the question, um, why you, basically? Um, and so I'm wondering if there were any moments that stood out to you during that debate. Yeah, so for the first time in, in these debates, pretty much all the candidates went after McAuliffe. Delegate Lee Carter, a self-proclaimed socialist that's also running, uh, criticized him for continually bringing up Trump and Youngkin um, and saying that he's not talking about how the party has to focus on defining itself with Trump out of office. Carol Foy said McAuliffe is the candidate Republicans want and that it could jeopardize the party's chances in November. And Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, who's had a pretty quiet campaign, Ended the, ended the debate talking about how the black candidates are being, quote, shut out, out of opportunities repeatedly and that it sends a signal to people about what our system truly values. Now, McAuliffe often kept at the stump and brushed any of the rebuttals or attacks aside and kept his focus on Youngkin and Trump. But his past debate definitely served as the last chance for candidates to really draw contrast between themselves and McAuliffe, and they definitely tried. Meanwhile, the Republican nominee for governor has already been decided. Tell us about Glenn Youngkins as a candidate. What's he campaigning on? Yeah, so Glenn Youngkin is a businessman that was a CEO at Car the Carlisle Group, a global investment firm. And he has a lot of money, all right, ready for his campaign. He's loaned <laughs> about $12 million to his campaign already. And he could continue to loan much more. For the general, he's going to try and run as that business-oriented, political outsider candidate to suburban voters especially. Uh, one professor in the state actually said it's actually a similar campaign to what McAuliffe is doing. Um, but during the primary, Youngkin would hit all of the hot-button issues for conservatives right now. He's against critical race theory being taught in schools. He has proposed an election integrity task force. Um, trying to build off the baseless claims of widespread voter fraud spread by President Trump. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz campaigned with him in the last week. But now he's looking to move back towards the middle and appeal to those suburban voters that moved towards the Democrat Party during Trump. And he has a bit of a blank slate since he has not been in office before. All right, Aaron, thank you so much for keeping a close eye on this one for us. Again, Election Day is Tuesday, and we'll be there as the results come in. Thank you.